Thank you, Daphne, and uh, <coughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like first to express my appreciation for the, to the Interdisciplinary Center for initiating the, and holding this uh, conference, which attempts to bring into view the subterranean uh, challenges and their warfare implications for a comprehensive and a substantive uh, discussions. The subterranean challenges challenge is not new real in the battlefield. We see it recorded even in Judean history as a method that, uh, in the battle uh, against the Romans. And having been a factor in both Lebanon and Gaza for the last two decades, it's not a new challenge for the IDF either. I would, however, argue that unlike the cyber realm, where the organizational inception phase, it was addressed as necessitating as, as a uh, comprehensive approach, subterranean challenges was not addressed as a realm of, uh, of its own. Moreover, lately we hear on the, the hypersonic threat, it's a real trend in the world. Uh, yet, these two realms, the cyber and the subterranean, are the only, one, the only realms that are highly connected to the civilian sphere, raising some fundamental questions and challenges. Although we, the IDF, recognized this challenge uh, and in the 2008 a roadmap uh, to address it was ordered, we failed to follow the roadmap successfully, as, it, as has been expected, uh, prior to Operation Protective Edge. During this operation, for the first time, the IDF experienced the subterranean uh, warfare <clears throat> in a way that had never happened before. We had to face this, uh, out of, uh, uh, this three out of four subterranean challenges. The, the attack tunnels that are uh, penetrating into Israel, the defense tunnels that are using uh, simply to defense the Gaza Strip, and also the third one, the concealment comp compound uh, tunnels, which are utilized uh, for a variety of purposes, such as uh, command and control rooms, long, uh, rocket launchers, and, uh, and more. Furthermore, it was the first time where the subterranean challenge became an objective that was ordered to be countered during operational combat. Operation Protective Edge took place a month before I ended my job as uh, the commander of uh, the division responsible for the Gaza Strip. Before I assumed the command, I assumed command, I took some, of, uh, some time for a learning process that resulted in two questions concerning uh, the time between wars. The first question was, how come since 2005, the previous time an attack tunnel uh, was used for the kidnapping, kidnapping of uh, Gilad Shalit, an IDF soldier, we, the IDF, never found an attack tunnel. These questions came after I learned uh, the intelligence that argued that, for, that we have about 26 tunnels, some being over three years old and operational uh, in re readiness, with operational readiness. My second question was how can my division eliminate the enemy intention to carry out another kidnap? And I reached this question after learning the strategic consequences that the kidnapping of Gilad Shalit, which made us to release dozens or hundreds of uh, prisoners, and was a huge debate uh, afterwards as well. So it started uh, early in, to, in November 2012, on my third day <coughs> as a division commander, a large ex explosive charge that had been uh, hidden in a tech tunnel was activated exactly on a vehicle that had parked right uh, on top of uh, it some minutes before, actually nine minutes before. We were lucky not to have any casualties. Two days after, the Hamas launched an anti-tech missiles in one of our uh, vehicles, leading the Israeli leadership to execute an operation against the Hamas named Operation Pillar of Defense. After the operation ended, I initiated a process to investigate how come Hamas was able to hit our vehicle that precisely. 
We investigate the whole operational process, meaning from the planning, the mission, all the way to executing it. We also asked how the headquarters and the forces behaved once the event took place. That resulted in some interesting conclusions. The reason that made us to come to this area was very similar to other operational events that took place only weeks before, three of them. Although the intelligence indicated that for three years, an attack tunnel was located in that area, this was not mentioned during the briefing before the, before the forces went to, their, to do their missions, and so it did not influence their operational behavior. The force were doing a great, a, a great, were doing great in addressing the above and the above the ground challenges, which I must say were very complicated in and of themselves. Third, we searched the area and we found sign of not only the explosive charge, which was a huge hole, about uh, five meters diameter, but some remains and clues that led us to understand that this was at the attack tunnel we had been looking for over three years. It was not uh, that no one was searching for it. We spoke to officers that dealt with that uh, specific tunnel before, and next to it we found uh, remains of several technologies assets that proved some, uh, that, proved that some uh, had tried uh, things before, yet we are not able to find the old tunnel. A few weeks after, in January 2013, three weeks after uh, we ended the, the investigation, we were lucky to find another attack tunnel that one of its exits <coughs> collapsed in Israel. This time we implemented some lesson learned in a way to, uh, we approached it. First, we trained our forces to deal with both man, uh, dimensions, both relay in the same time, means your force maneuver takes into account the two dimension in the same time. Second, we used new tactics. New tactics uh, that takes a, a <coughs> new tactics so the enemy won't be able to take advantage of our forces and to hit us, because they try to do it with snipers, missiles, and so forth. One of the obstacles that we faced was that we were unable to use fire, uh, firepower since ceasefire took place. Third, we wanted to reveal the tunnel and to maintain it in an undamaged state in order to study it better and also to be able to use it as an R&D site. So therefore, we decided of new combat uh, engineering techniques and capabilities. We used a new uh, combat, uh, uh, combat engineering techniques and capabilities. It took several weeks to reveal it completely, meaning the tunnel and its different splits off and other uh, very sophisticated explosive charges, very sophisticated ones that were very new for us <coughs> and other things that we revealed, but it was highly worth for several reasons. First, we were able to compare the tunnels to the intelligence reports that which we, we wrote over three, for over three years. While it, made, it matched by over 90%, yet no one was able to find it for several years. Second, we were able to view the gaps between the tunnel and the, difference, uh, the different technology results that has been uh, indicated the uh, years before. Third, we invited through the uh, Minister of Defense uh, R&D Department, uh, Itai was the representative, uh, he briefed you before, any company that wanted to try its current technology. Many comp companies came, including companies from outside of Israel, such as our American partners, who sent some capabilities. Not surprisingly, no one was able to detect the tunnel. A couple of years after, it's 2013, January 2013, five years after the roadmap that was ordered for us. Uh, based on the conclusion, after our experience with those two tunnels, we decided to act on the <coughs> two patterns. 
First, we started to do some drillings in areas where we assumed the tunnels might be located uh, or that the activity will help us to learn some things on our enemy, the way he view us. Second, and it was, this was the, <coughs> uh, the main effort, we addressed the intelligence echelon. We took three decisions in that aspect. First, we established a special intelligence analysis team, and here comes the second part. This team had to uh, take the same intelligence database that we had uh, before and to view it from, from different uh, perspective. And the third was to have an interdisciplinary forum based on the IDI in Israel intelligence uh, uh, <coughs> people, personnel, from all disciplines, mean technological analysis, cyber scientists, and more, and others, sorry. I was asked many times, didn't you ask for any more uh, intelligence resources? Uh, honestly speaking, we asked for nothing more as we realized that we were already had almost everything. Therefore, we needed to ask different qu questions and to be, <clears throat> to be able to overcome uh, some mistakes. Uh, it did take some answers, however, it was worth it. We were able to find the first tunnel and a few weeks after the second one uh, by ourselves, based on the same intelligence and unfortunately the same capabilities. Uh, the team analysis leader said very nicely that the first time the drillers were able to, to beat the diggers and it was the first time to be one step ahead. The importance of the intelligence analysis resulted in a different thing, different differentiating that health of what we assume to be attack tunnels into Israel are not actually attack tunnels. On the other hand, we are able to understand better the Hamas doctrine, and therefore we an the analyze team pinpoint 16 more tunnels, mean 32 tunnels, uh, attack tunnels in different operational status that coming into Israel. We also found that many tunnels, especially those that are, were operational already, one or, or two of their entrance in Gaza were located in public sites such as mosques, kindergarten, and so forth. Based on the, uh, the, assuming, uh, based on the assumed Hamas doctrine, we changed the TTPs that we used to handle uh, in the field. The main idea was that the force that will be able to, any force will be able to face successfully any kidnapping attack that will be based on attack tunnel, assuming that no early alert will be given. This was one of the gaps that we had, that we are at a challenge how to give an alert, early alert, that a kidnapping is supposed to happen in one of the tunnels. And you have to go around Gaza Strip and to let all the farmers to walk on the fields as needed. And those tunnels, some of their exits are in the fields themselves. Up to this point, we are dealing mostly with the detecting the tunnels, but at this point, in order to change the Hamas calculus and to face it with some uh, challenges, we decided to destroy one of the tunnels in a way that the Hamas wouldn't be able to use it anymore. The decision made us to face new challenges, some tactical, some technological, but we went unsurprisingly to the strategic level. From the strategic perspective, one of the dilemmas was are we, the IDF, violating the ceasefire <coughs> once we're destroying a part of the tunnel that is located west to the security fence, meaning within Gaza Strip? Under the ceasefire restriction, we had, uh, uh, we had to act only uh, up to the end of the parameter that is west to the security fence. One might, might ask, uh, uh, how come you didn't destroy the old tunnel? There were several uh, reasons for that, uh, this decision. The leadership at that time, the, uh, uh, the priorities were mostly uh, on Iran. And remember the years, just before the JCPOA. But also the technology was not there. It was not mature enough to let us both to map the old tunnel precisely and quickly enough to destroy it. 
This issue exposed the enemy to, uh, to it was uh, exposed to us to the enemy, which understood very well that we had to place uh, the, where, where are we going to act, and he placed an explosive charge at the point which resulted with an officer that uh, being uh, very heavily injured. And so you'll be able to listen to him tomorrow, Chia Klein is a, is a hero. I will leave the stage for him uh, to uh, share with you the, his story. Yet this brings to the question, should the enemy penetrate to your territory? Shouldn't Israel have the all the just, 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 this justifications to act as needed proportionally and etc against an attack tunnel that aimed at citizens? Shouldn't, from the moral perspective, the risk supposed to be placed on the one who established it? Those questions have been asked in our leadership and uh, are sti still are, and we also face the same questions uh, a year from now, like last year, last December, on operation uh, up in, that took place up in the north against the Hezbollah. How can we act while we are not violating any ceasefire agreement or UN resolutions and so forth? On the technological part, the challenge that we, that, uh, is that when you speak of tunnels, it is quite complicated. Uh, how many of you have been in tunnels? If you may raise hand. Okay, very well, it's more than the average. Uh, I won't go far too deep to, de to, deep, uh, to do the details, but I've described the, the challenge as how can you destroy, but not to give your enemy a present of a wider tunnel once it removes the dirt. And this is the challenge. And we made some mistake in that sense. Based on the experience up to this point, we decided on three main actions. First, my division initiated a technological project <clears throat> with the IDI technological unit that resulted with a capability that was a key factor on our mission at the Operation Protective Edge. Uh, <clears throat> rightly, they were decorated uh, with a medal after this uh, operation. Second, we decided to initiate a program that aimed to influence international arena that will support Israel action against the tech tunnel and more. Two reasons generated this initiative. First one was the reports, are the reports after the uh, two operation in 2009 and 2012 that blamed Israel for its policy acting in Gaza Strip. And we, to just to remind us, in 2009, we also acted against a tunnel. Was one of the reasons for the operation. Second, we understood that the subterranean warfare is something unknown to most militaries and countries. We invited all the military attaches and some ambassadors, and most, uh, the one that visited several times was ambassador, the US ambassador to, to Israel, Mr. Dan Shapiro, and other NGOs too. We are privileged to host a delegation of retired U.S. generals. Among them was the ex-Marine commander that asked and faced me personally with professional questions as needed. This honor general, I was, uh, I knew later on after the operation, they, they wrote their own report days after the operation started. Uh, and basically they delivered it uh, to the U.S. leadership and it highly influenced the U.S. leadership uh, opinion of the operation and gave Israel a huge room how to act against those tunnels. Uh, <clears throat> third, we are working with the active brigades on TTPs for wartime. If such will occur and it happened. I must say that we were not well prepared. Forces were able to discuss and train in the tunnels, in the Hamas tunnels that we found and we saved them for those purposes. Uh, but to face really so subterranean warfare, professionally speaking, it's something very complicated for a soldier. It, you don't do it in one or two or three training. It takes time. It's a new realm, uh, and we're not able to implement it as expected. I would like to share some of the maneuver challenges that uh, we faced in the operation, in that operation, that, uh, which hopefully will assist you on the coming discussions. Uh, once a force maneuver in an area that contains uh, both dimensions above and under the underground, uh, many of the operational def definitions must change as well as the planning assumptions. 
The enemy wants to force, to, uh, to force us to maneuver on both above and underground, as its intention is to slow us down, that he will be able to launch more rockets, missiles, and so forth, and even to deliver some more attacks uh, uh, through a attack tunnel into, uh, against uh, civilians. The challenge, therefore, is how can we maneuver fast enough or right uh, in that sense? And in that sense, for example, what does it mean that a building was cleared? That the force declare of a building that is clear that you can come into this uh, building. I can tell you, and we will share with you, that we face several times when the enemy pumps up from the floor or from the underground in buildings, hours or days after a force declare of it as the building uh, that it is safe enough. This was where our capabilities in that time uh, and the techniques uh, too. We had some gaps. We ask ourselves, should we take care of every tunnel, to, uh, every defense uh, compound, and so forth. Uh, and for a while, some claimed we should not enter those tunnels. I don't think, they don't think that in the future we have this privilege. Since we are, have two trends, one is the urbanization that, uh, frankly speaking, urbanization means uh, many tunnels and so forth. And secondly, the enemies worldwide, it's not just in, Hama, in uh, Lebanon or Gaza. I heard it from uh, my counterparts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places. They understand the advantages that the underground uh, realm has. So they are building more and more of this uh, type uh, of uh, <coughs> defense and attack uh, capabilities. So I would suggest for this conference to assume that we should have the capability to, to deal with every subterranean challenge uh, in, in order to initiate or to build up an advantage upon the, the enemy. Because in the tunnel itself, and uh, I deal with this, and I saw some uh, close fire uh, events in that sense, all the advantages that we have outside are diminishing almost into the zero inside the tunnel. And this is one of the problems. When I speak almost zero, it means your firepower, communication, maneuvering, and in general, and many, many things. I would like to address the liability issue and one of the challenges that we had. Many tunnels are coming, as I mentioned, from civilian buildings and so forth. And if you want to destroy a tunnel, and your explosive device will destroy a 10 stories building, is it okay? Is it justified enough or not? Who, who uh, is carrying the liability in that sense? And it's after having uh, dealing with the proportionality actions and so forth, still, still, one of the problems that we don't have the intelligence that where every tunnel is at. And we need to have, so if I would have to sum it up, what are the gaps are? We have to be able to detect very fast the tunnels, to maneuver, to maneuver uh, <coughs> right in the right way with no more, not too many casualties and so forth, and to destroy it or to neutralize it as needed, to have different capabilities means that there is no, in my opinion, no one silver bullet for tunnels. It's an all strategy, all capability that we must have in order to uh, face it uh, uh, the right way. I would like to say that since July 2014, uh, we had some advances, uh, advanced uh, TTPs. I must say that uh, our R&D guys did a great job both for maneuvering and uh, for detecting tunnels that are being digged into Israel. Uh, we have a great cooperation with our friends from the US, a really good one for the past uh, few years. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to uh, face next time uh, those, uh, this challenge, because we'll face it here in Lebanon and Gaza, we'll face it uh, for sure. Uh, and I leave some minutes uh, for Q&A, please. <coughs> 